Am I oh. oh, I apologize. <laughs> oh, <right>. No worry. <laughs> okay. Yes, you have my consent. Oh, yes. Okay. Do you guys see my... Okay, this won't... Let me stop sharing for a second. Okay, there we go. Sorry. Not at all. Sorry if I knocked you off there. Oh, no, 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 we're good. We're all good. Um, uh, thank you so much for um, uh, allowing me to present my doctoral research. My name is Danielle Phelps, uh, or you can call me Danny. Um, I graduated from the University of Arizona in 2020. Oh, 2020, <laughs> last May, um, pandemic year. Yay. Um, and I focused, I did, I graduated in anthropology with the emphasis in archaeology. Um, and so I actually have a lot of experience in archaeology. I've spent over 18 years in a variety of different uh, areas around the world, including Egypt, Mexico, Italy, uh, the Western Caribbean, uh, Mexico, and even I've done some CRM work here in Arizona. Oh, and I'm in Tucson, Arizona, so uh, West Coast. Um, and what tonight I'm going to be talking about is my dissertation and a part of it. Um, I actually examined the tomb of Tutankhamun or King Tut uh, through an anthropological lens and at different scales. Uh, when I was doing my research, I thought King Tut had been well covered in the hundred years since his discovery of his tomb. And I came across information that had never really been looked at. And Egyptologists are always 50 years behind archaeology, who's 50 years behind all the other fields. And so no one had actually applied um, anthropological theories, statistical analyses, or even GIS to the Valley of the Kings and to the tombs to see the spatial distribution um, and patterns found in the King in the Valley of the Kings. So tonight I'm going to be looking, uh, I'll be doing a condensed version of my dissertation um, uh, presentation and we'll be focusing on the spatial distribution of the post Amarna tombs and I'll give you a brief background for people who are not, um, <laughs> who didn't spend all 10 years reading about King Tut in the 18th dynasty of ancient Egypt. Um, and then we'll look at the burial itself and the artifacts in his burial assemblage and what that um, probably, uh, why he was buried the way he was buried. Um, I know he died. Everyone likes to uh, speculate on how he died, if he was murdered, if he died from an accident or died from malaria, whatever. I don't care, he died. Um, and so I wanna see why he was buried the way he was. Instead of just being focusing on him being the king, why certain artifacts were placed in his tomb. And this all correlates into what I think the ancient Egyptian kings uh, were trying to do with King Tut since he wasn't that well of known king um, if his tomb had never been found. So just to orient ourselves, this is a map of Egypt. Um, you can see the Nile that goes right down the middle. Uh, the three side or four sides we're gonna talk about are um, the Memphis, which was the political capital, it's today underneath the modern day city of Cairo or in the suburbs of Cairo. So we actually don't know the layout of Memphis, of ancient Memphis or um, a lot of the stuff because people just kept building over top of it. Uh, Akhenaten or Telamarna, Telamarna. Uh, the city that uh, King Tut's father Akhenaten built um, in the middle of Egypt and even today it's in the middle of nowhere. <laughs> um, and we're also going to be focusing primarily on the Valley of the Kings, which is on the west bank of the Nile River across from Thebes or modern day Egypt or modern day Luxor, which was the religious capital of the ancient world. And King Tut when he was alive would transfer his or spend his time either in Memphis or in Thebes and when he was younger he was at Akhenaten in the middle of Egypt. And so for today, we're going to focus really on um, the Valley of the Kings for the most part. So this is the Valley of the Kings. Um, this is a picture looking into the valley from the south over from the top of the mountain. And most people don't realize that the Valley of the Kings actually are two valleys. Um, we have the first 
the Eastern Valley, which is where King Tut's tomb is and all the primary, the big tombs, the ones that the tourists always go to and you can like climb up and crawl into the different tombs and see the spectacular paintings. And then there's the Western Valley, which is a, at the fork in the road and actually contains four tombs that date to right before King Tut. And um, it's almost like the West Valley was going to be another family cemetery for the 18th dynasty, but uh, was discontinued when um, Akhenaten, King Tut's father, uh, abandoned the Valley of the Kings. And so we're going to focus primarily on these tombs of King Tut, which is found here. King Tut's tomb is actually right here, um, right next to that uh, visitor's house. Um, and the other tombs that date to the same time period of King Tut's uh, tomb. And these tombs are called the post Amarna tombs. Uh, we'll talk about in a second why they're called post Amarna, but it just refers to tombs built after the reign of Akhenaten. Um, and these tombs are all associated with individuals associated with that uh, Akhenaten's royal family are come or his immediate successors before you go into the 19th dynasty with Seti the first and Ramses the second. And so the tombs, uh, the post martyr tombs are the ones I focused on. And their KV number just means King, King Valley number. Um, so we have King Tut's cache, 54. We have the Amarna cache, which might contain the body of Akhenaten. Um, something that's called the gold tomb, which was built during the 18th dynasty, but later repurposed and reused by later kings. Uh, the tomb of Hormheb, who was the last king of the 18th dynasty, who was a general of King Tut. Um, KV58, which is an unknown tomb, but has similar equipment that's associated with this post Amarna tomb. King Tut's tomb, KV62, if you hear me talk about that, that's what I'm talking about. And then um, in 2009, uh, the University of Memphis actually discovered the newest tomb then, uh, KV63, uh, which was the Amarna cache. Um, recently, they discovered uh, KV64 in 2015, but that dates to a little bit earlier than the time period we're uh, interested in. And so these are the uh, these are the tombs we're going to look at in depth. Uh, KV54 and 62 are King Tut's tomb, and then KV63 is the one that was found. Um, that's another cache or a tomb to contain all these artifacts that belong uh, that belong to some other tomb and just couldn't be fit into one tomb. So. In order to set the story and understand what is happening, we have to look at the history of the late Bronze Age of the Mediterranean in ancient Egypt. Um, specifically, we're going to look at the 18th dynasty, which was a period of, um, oh, that's a wrong date, uh, the 18th dynasty, which uh, was a period of about 12 kings, all from the same family for the most part, that ruled in succession and really made Egypt the international superpower that it would be for the new kingdom of during the whole late Bronze Age. Uh, the 18th dynasty is considered the golden age of dynastic Egypt. In fact, a lot of the temples that stand today uh, really were built and fortified during the New Kingdom. And so that's why Karnak is so impressive, uh, Medina Habu is really impressive, and even Deir al-Bahri, uh, the funerary temple of Hatshepsut. It's also during this period that we have an expansion of territory. Prior to this, um, prior to the New Kingdom, Egypt really was a uh, more focus on themselves and keeping people out of their boundaries like the Nubians and the Hyksos and this, um, yeah, and the Hyksos. And so they really didn't have enough time to focus on being an international powerhouse until they get to the 18th dynasty and a series of warrior kings come over. And with this expansion of territory, it actually brings with them a wealth of um, booty and <laughs> treasures and whatnot. So they can build these massive temple complexes. Uh, the kings start to realize they can't be buried in pyramids, that they should be buried in secret locations because the pyramids to them were even old. They were about 2000 years old when the 18th dynasty came into existence and they knew they had already been robbed. And so these kings of the 18th dynasty realized they had to hide their wealth. And so they'd have tombs built in the Valley of the Kings. And then they would build these expansive temples on the outskirts of this mountain Theban necropolis. And it was right next to the Nile and they could actually have access to that. Also during this 
time period, we see the rise of a unified religion with a one main god being the um, uh, reigning god of the dynastic period of the 18th dynasty. That god's a moon. Uh, he was really important to the 18th dynasty kings. He's considered the hidden one. Um, we kind of think he was probably associated with the breeze. So the Egyptians could feel him whenever the breeze would come up, but they could never see him. And he also had his counterpart, Ray, or Ra, uh, depending on how you like to say it, who's really associated with more of lower Egypt or up in the Delta area. And people were really attuned with this because they could see the sun and they could feel the breeze. And so at some point they actually become syncretized and become Amun-Re um, or Amun-Ra. Uh, that is a very popular um, name <laughs> to use in pop, in pop culture. So this is just a king's list of the 18th dynasty. Uh, we have what's called the prenomen, which is the, um, we're going to focus on these latter kings. Uh, these are the ones who are important to our story today. Uh, but if you see the first name, if people always get confused. Why are there so many names? Um, the ancient Egyptians actually, when they became king, had five names. Uh, we usually identify the kings by their first two names, their prenomen, which is the name the king took upon his accession to the throne. So um, King Tut's prenomen is actually Neb Keperu Re. And then his nomen, which is his birth name, so Tut Ankh Amun. Um, in fact, King Tut's name actually was Tut Ankh Aten when he was born. And then when he came to the throne, he actually changed it to Tut Ankh Amun to reflect um, a difference in religious patterns. And so we're gonna really focus on Amenhotep III, his son Amenhotep IV, who changed his name to Akhenaten, uh, King Nefernefernuwaten, who was a female king, uh, King Tut, and then his two successors, I and Hormheb. So this is the late 18th dynasty. These are the kings that we're really going to be focused about, um, especially the ones in purple or in purple square. So we have King Tut, who was the last king of this long line of rulers for this one family called the Tutmos line. Um, his father was Akhenaten, Amenhotep IV, who changed his name. We think his mom was Nefertiti. Uh, we don't have her mummy and the DNA evidence is questionable. Um, some say that she's a sister of Amenhotep IV. Uh, others say she's Nefertiti. Based on my own research, I'm, it makes more sense if she was Nefertiti um, and not some unnamed, uh, white, or unnamed sister of Akhenaten. And we're also going to focus on I, who was probably related to the royal family through marriage and might have even been Nefertiti's father. We do not know who Nefertiti's parents were. They're never named. We do know that she had a sister called <laughs> Mutno Jemet or Mutno Bre uh, Mubenet, um, but we don't know who, they're, who they belong to. Um, we don't know how they are, but they have to have been associated with the royal family in some kind of way in order to be um, part of the inner royal circle. So in the late 18th, 18th, late 18th dynasty, we have Amenhotep III. Um, this is setting the stage. His reign really sets the stage for what happens to King Tut when he comes to the throne. Amenhotep III is this king right here. He was the most prolific builder in all of Egypt, Egyptian history. The reason we don't know his name as well as, as we do Ramses II um, is because Ramses II took all of his stuff and put his name on Amenhotep III's buildings. <laughs> so Ramses II saw convenience and realized he didn't have to build everything because Amenhotep III already did it. Amenhotep III, uh, Amenhotep III really was uh, living off the fruits of his predecessor's labors. Uh, he didn't need to expand his territory anyway. Um, he could just live the high life being a king, getting drunk, having diplomatic marriages, having a harem, building his own palaces everywhere. Um, and so he's really focused on living life and <laughs> being a god, which he did become when he was alive. Um, they had this uh, celebration called the Hebsed, which happened, supposed to happen every 38 
years of a king's reign. Uh, but Hamunhotep III had his first when he was in his 30, uh, 30th year. And then he was like, ah, I need another one. So he had one like three years later. Um, you can kind of think of them as the Olympics for kings or just great big celebrations. And it was during one of these that he actually deified himself and kind of said, I'm a god, I'm a living god, which really played a number on his son. Akhenaten or Amenhotep IV, who then changed his name to Akhenaten when he came to the throne. Um, Akhenaten was not the intended heir. His older brother was, and his older brother died, and so he became heir. And when he did, he played along with the traditional pantheon and with the priesthood of Amun for the first year or two, but then all of a sudden he says enough is enough and he changes the royal art iconography. In fact, he's one of the most well-known pharaohs today uh, because of his unique appearance in his sculptures that have survived and that we've been able to put back together. He reigned for about 17, maybe 18 years. We don't know exactly when he died because we still don't have his mummy for sure yet. Um, but during his reign, he had enough of um, the influence from the priests of Amun because he was more connected with the priest of Ra. And so he literally moved the religious capital from Thebes, from modern day Luxor, to the middle of nowhere Egypt. And he called this new site Akhet Aten or the horizon of the Aten because he really was dedicated to the worship of the solar disk, the Aten. Um, and he even worshiped it so much he changed his name to reflect his um, uh, allegiance to it. We know Akhenaten, or we're pretty sure he wasn't that focused on military campaigns. He might have had one or two, we aren't quite sure. But we do know because of the Amarna letters, all these correspondence with these, um, uh, his sphere of influence with all these different kings of the Near East, of Cyprus, of the Mycenaeans, was really well developed. And um, everyone looked to Egypt and everyone wanted gold because Egypt was the gold capital of the late Bronze Age. So Akhenaten really had this, what people have called a revolution, um, and it wasn't a revolution for everyone. <laughs> it was really a, a religious revolution for the elite and the court. Um, modern day people, uh, the common day people who built the city of Telamarna just went around their daily lives and had individual worship of the old gods. Um, they didn't really have to do much. They just kept everything quiet. Um, but the court and the elites had to change everything. They had to reject the traditional pantheon. So they had to get rid of Horus and Seth and Anubis and Hathor and all the people they had grown up with. And they had to accept the worship of only the sun disk, the Aten. And they, all, they also had to come to the grips with the idea that Akhenaten and Nefertiti were the only two people that who could worship, who could really connect with the Aten. Um, they were part of this holy trinity uh, and represented the earth, the sky, and the sun disk, which is uh, an idea that wasn't too foreign to the Egyptians, except the Egyptians had these two gods, Tefnut and Shu, instead of Akhenaten and Nefertiti. And so Akhenaten really suggested to the elites in, the, in the, his court and his royal family that you had to worship him in order to worship the sun and that only salvation would become through uh, your worship of Akhenaten. Uh, in his later part of his reign, he actually closed a lot of the cult's temples. So the temple of Amun was closed, Karnak was closed, anything that didn't have any specific reverence to the Aten was just closed and disband dismembered or disbanded, <laughs> not dismembered. Um, and this pissed off the priesthood of Amun, who actually were really powerful and had had a really sweet life for the last 200 years. And so they started getting angry um, and they just were kind of pissed off. We even know um, Akhenaten had some kind of hatred with Amun that he actually erased any mention of the name of Moon, even from his own father's cartouches, because uh, he could not have a Moon's name anywhere. So I don't know if he had some beef with the Moon or some, the, that's still a mystery, but this really affected it. And he also got rid of a lot of the mortuary practices uh, that were associated. We always think of Egyptian mortuary practices as being 
set and not changing in 5,000 years. But Akhenaten made the elites say, uh, when you die, you don't get to go to the field of reeds. You don't get to have this eternal life. You just stay in your tomb at night and then you come to the city of Akhenaten to stay in my uh, to stay in his temple um, during the day, and you just repeat that there is no light, there is no life after death. You just have to live with the sun, and so it really affected a lot of the elites. And his death probably wasn't uh, cried about when he died. <laughs> so what happened when he died? Well. He had a young son, Tutankhamun, or Tutankhaten, um, and he probably was the son of Nefertiti and Akhenaten. He came to the throne himself around eight years old, and that was probably after two-year, three-year reign of his mother, Nefertiti, as sole pharaoh. And with Tutankhamun, he actually restored the, pal uh, the traditional pantheons and the temples and the priesthoods of Amun and all the different gods were reinstated. Um, and so he actually is considered like to the Egyptians, he was really like, oh, thank God, Akhenaten's gone. This weird female king, Ankeperure, is gone. We have a boy again. He's in charge. He has these uh, viziers and generals leading his army in the country. We'll will be fine. And so he really was uh, welcomed back, or at least that's what the texts tell us. Uh, eventually he died. It wasn't, he didn't get to live a long time. He died when he was around 18 years old and he was then buried in the Valley of the Kings by his successor, I. And as I said before, he was buried in the East Valley, which is over here, instead of where his grandfather, Amenhotep III, was buried over here on the West Valley. So that's kind of the background for King Tut. And what I did was I actually looked at why he was buried in KV-62. It's a small tomb for a king. It's even one who only reigned for 10 years. He should have this huge tomb, but he didn't have that. Um, and so I wanted to understand what, what possible reasons there could be for this weird burial of King Tut and these post Amarna tombs. And so I really wanted to look at the social memory of what was happening in Egypt during this time period. And in King Tut's tomb itself, it's great because it has over 5,000 artifacts. So we can actually look at specific artifacts and do statistical analysis on them. And so I looked at these three different aspects. I looked at objects of memory, uh, these are objects that are identified with specific people. I looked at inalienable objects. And inalienable objects are these um, objects that have special connections with past individuals. But instead of being able to keep them out in the open or maybe pass them on to your children, you can't do that. You have to keep them with that individual. You can kind of think of them somewhat like the crown jewels of, e of England. Uh, even though they're today now like on display in the Tower of London, uh, they are still inalienable objects because you don't really circulate them amongst the population. You only have them with the specific family members. And then I also looked at intentionally forgetting. And we always talk in anthropology, we always talk about memory and what people in the past do to memorialize people or how they memorize people. But King Tut is unique because he wasn't memorialized, he was forgotten. And we I want to look at why he would be forgotten. Like if he was this king who restored everything, why was he simply wiped off the face of history from the Egyptian point of view? Um, and we would not even know about King Tut if Howard Carter hadn't found his intact tomb. So I use GIS a lot, um, and this is a map I made. Uh, prior to me making these GIS maps, I thought for sure that um, the Valley of the Kings had had a, a GIS, a Geographic Information Systems map made, um, a digital elevation model. I found out that not happened. Um, the Egyptian government might, government might have one, but uh, they are not. Um, they're not in the right place yet to share their GIS information or I'm not high enough in the uh, bureaucracy. So I made my own map using information from Kent Weeks, who is a phenomenal Egyptologist and has done a lot of work on the Valley of the Kings, but he's never used any of the spatial analyses available to us today to look at the relationships of these tombs in the Valley of the Kings. And so I looked at that. Um, there are today, 
64 tomb, known tombs um, in the Valley of the Kings. I think Zahi Hawass always comes around and says there's 60, there's a 65th one, but um, for sure we don't have any definitive information yet about that. And as you can see, the majority of the tombs are in this Eastern Valley. Uh, KV-22 is the tomb of Abenhotep III, Tut's grandfather. And then we have the beginnings of three different tombs here that some people have said was the beginnings of Akhenaten's tomb before he moved away to Telemarna. Or, and maybe a queen tomb or, or another tomb there, but we don't know what for sure because they were just stopped and halted. Um, the new, the newest KV-64 is in here, and then what they found a few uh, last year, the year before, is that workshop is found in this valley over here. And so we're going to focus on this side. So KV-62 was discovered November 4th, 1922 by Howard Carter. Uh, he was a painter. <laughs> That's how he got into Egyptology. He uh, was a, a student of William Flanders Petrie, and he actually saw the um, necessary the necessity to record everything in a purposeful manner. Um, during the early 1900s, people literally would go into the tombs that they found in the Valley of Kings and blow stuff up and just grab everything and then sell it or keep it for themselves. Um, so Carter was actually really good. He took detailed notes for the most part. There were some stuff that he would be like, ah, it's just a shoe that melted, or it's a reed flip-flop. I'm going to throw it away. <laughs> so it wasn't the best. It's not as like detailed as we're used to, to the, today. But for the 1900s, it was really good. He, his work was sponsored by Lord Carnarvon. Um, if you guys are fans of Down Abbey, the Down Abbey is actually the Carnarvon's house or pal palace. Um, and there's actually some, or there were some artifacts from Tut's tomb in Carnarvon's house up until the 1980s. Um, his oh, Howard Carter is fascinating and I can give you a reference book uh, if you want more information about his discovery and how he manipulated the media uh, before there was a social media aspect. I would love to see what he would have done today's day of age. So he found the tomb in 1922. Oops. And this is what the tomb looks like. Um, it's on the bottom of the valley floor. Uh, this is KV-10, which is a much later about um, 200 year later tomb that was built on top of it because they forgot about King Tut's tomb. And Tut's tomb is you go through here and you go down to the step, steps into Tut's tomb and it goes underneath down here and then underneath into this rock face. And this is the burial or architectural plan of KV62. You can see it has an entrance, entrance staircase. It has a relatively short corridor and then it has four rooms for this king of the 18th dynasty who was literally had the gold of Egypt. His tomb should have been huge. Um, he was alive for 10 years and King Tut chose, was supposedly one of the first things a king did when he came to the throne was to choose a burial spot. So this small corridor tomb is not fit for a king. And so there's always been this question of why he was buried here. I think the latest speculation is that this is actually belongs to Nefertiti and that there's a burial, another chamber back here. I don't know about that uh, since I'm focusing more on King Tut. And I wanted to know why this tomb had over 500 or 5,000 artifacts just stuffed in there and why he didn't, couldn't have a bigger tomb. This is um, a, uh, Carter's actual drawing. He was he was a painter, and so he actually took great pictures and, of a layout. Um, so even though he didn't have AutoCAD, he had a really good plan. Unfortunately, he didn't do it for every chamber, uh, but he did for the burial chamber and the antechamber. And you can see it's really stuffed to the brim with chariots and bread baskets and. Um, Beds. This is a little uh, side chamber that went into the anti um, into the annex that actually had a bunch of more stuff that looks like everyone's storage closet where you put your brooms and coats and you don't want to see anything. And then the burial chamber is off to this side, and then the treasury was down here. And there's a lot of great um, uh, 3D models of King Tut's tomb being around today and they're doing photogrammetry um, of King Tasuma. And there's a lot of cool stuff because it's King Tut. 
So when I looked at his burial assemblage, I was really intrigued because in normal burial assemblages, especially for Royal 18th burials, you have three basic categories. You have daily life objects. So these are like amphora vessels filled with wine, uh, perfume bottles, jewelry, furniture, chairs, stools, um, clothing, loincloths. <laughs> he had something like 300 loincloths, um, almost one for every day of the week or every day of the year, sorry tunics, headdresses, get toiletry items, and we find these types of things in a lot of the different tombs, even though they've been uh, robbed, there's some of these stuff still appears. Uh, in royal burials, for sure, we actually have, we know that there are objects of authority, so there are like, chariots, because those are super expensive, not everyone had access to horses or chariots, uh, weaponry, uh, the more elites had archery, swords, that sort of stuff. Uh, king Tut, because he was a king, actually had symbols of authority, so he had scepters and flails and um, like the Hekka scepter right here and the flail. And then, of course, you also have the funerary objects, the sarcophagus, uh, coffins, beers, canopic jars, ritual figurines, shaptis, uh, little clay figures, mummified figures made to work in the afterlife so you don't have to, papyrus, all this sort of stuff. And this was a typical Egyptian burial. And King Tut had the majority of this. He doesn't have any papyrus, though. We have no papyrus. It's really rare. Um, so we don't know if they intentionally didn't leave any kind of Book of the Dead or any kind of directions or um, writings of him. The Egyptians just didn't bury him with that. But then he has what I called atypical artifacts in KV62. Um, these artifacts are often mentioned in passing in many of the different uh, books published about King Tut, but they're usually just categorized as either daily life, funerary, or um, object of authority. But when you look at them more closely, there's something unique about them. Many of them probably were heirlooms or keepsakes because they come from earlier family members or immediate family members. Um, and these actually have the names of those immediate family members on them. And a lot of the times, Egyptologists say, explain that they're found, that they were probably just taken from storage or they're just laying around the palace and they had to fill this tomb of King Tut really quickly. So they just pulled everything and uh, put it in there. But then he has these childhood mementos. Um, he has a chair made for King Tut when he was a young boy. He has tunics that would have only fit him as an eight-year-old boy that were gifts from Syrian princes. And these artifacts are kept in there. And these childhood mementos are only found in King Tut's tomb. We don't have any evidence of any other Egyptian royal burial having any type of childhood object. And so this childhood object really intrigued me when I first started looking at his burial assemblage. When you look at normal royal tombs, you can kind of see the separation between life and death. Um, so you have, uh, a bunch of chambers dedicated to daily life things. So you have um, scenes of Ray coming out, you have uh, the other gods leading a king towards the burial chamber, which then marks the transition into the burial sphere um, or the funerary sphere. And you, in fact, go down into the earth when you go into the burial chamber um, because you're going to the afterlife, you're going to a different location. Even in King Tut's tomb, even though it's not that big, you actually take two or three steps down into the burial chamber where his sarcophagus was found. And we can actually see a lot of these components of a royal tomb were kind of squished into King Tut's tomb uh, because it was so small, but he still has a chamber that's really dedicated to the living aspect where his uh, chariots are where a lot of his food were um, and then the burial chambers where his body was and the funerary aspects used in his procession were found in the funerary side and we can actually see this quite clearly in the distribution of artifacts as well when I did statistical analyses on the uh, burial assemblage uh, <laughs> using a 
taking a long time, I actually saw that the separation between life and death could even be seen where the placement of these artifacts were. You had uh, the entrance into the tomb, the daily life aspect were filled in the antechamber in the corridors and in the annex. And then there were the funerary aspects purely for the funeral process for the mummification found in the burial chamber in the treasury. There was some overlap, though, because King Tut's even though, tomb, even though it was intact, actually was robbed twice within a year or two of its being buried. And each time the necropolis guards would come in and chase them away, and then the guards were responsible for packing everything back up, and they didn't give a care in the world about this being a, some king. They were like, he's dead, he won't care that his loincloths are being mixed up with his royal statues. And so we actually have some mixture in that is probably due to the uh, hurried cleanup by the royal guards. And to the Egyptians, it's really important to have the separation between life and death. Um, the burial chamber really was the journey and the location where you had transformed into a ancestral spirit, an auk. Um, and this is where you have your body located and your body is actually manipulated to a specific image. So you can become an ancestor, you can become part of this uh, afterlife where you can go into the field of reeds and enjoy the afterlife forever. And it almost looks like in King Tut's tomb that they're really trying to emphasize this transformation back into the traditional pantheon with, uh, with the worship of Osiris and the traditional mortuary sphere and whatnot and funerary lives. Um, because we see his body was intentionally manipulated to look like Osiris and even uh, another god, Min, who is associated with the afterlife, a uh, fertility god. And we know this because Carter actually took detailed notes when he was dismantling King Tut's mummy. I wish he hadn't, but you know, they didn't have a good enough x-rays back then. Um, and King Tut wasn't responsible for his manipulation of his body. He was already dead. And so it fell upon the shoulders of his successor, I, to transform his this predecessor's body into this cultic image. Um, he had, uh, his mummy was, covered in resin, this black tar stuff to make him look like he had black skin like Osiris. I uh, even had an erect penis, which is symbolizing both Osiris and men. And he even had the crossed arms, which were at a much lower angle than you find in any other king of the new kingdom in a mummification process, process. But it still, it looks like the Osiris statues you see of Osiris holding his arms down below. And so we have the separation between daily life and life, and we can actually see it through the placement of specific artifacts. But then those specific artifacts also give us insight into why these weird atypical artifacts would have been buried with King Tut in the first place. Uh, we have what I identified are um, five different aspects, heirlooms, gifts, childhood mementos, keepsakes, and then repurposed items. Uh, people usually like to say they were uh, usurped, but I think they were just repurposed for a, for a male body instead of a female body. So heirlooms are actually quite common in 18th dynasty burials. In fact, um, these in the green are heirlooms found in different burials in the Valley of the Kings. Um, they don't, they were heirlooms, they weren't belonging to the individual associated with the tomb, they belong to a family member or a respected member of the family. We find a lot of Amenhotep III um, found in different burials associated with um, heirlooms. In King Tut's case, we actually have a lot of heirlooms associated with his grandmother, his grandfather, and then a esteemed ancestor, Tutmos III, who would have been his great, great, great grandfather, I think it was, uh, who was considered the Napoleon of Egypt and really was what everyone wanted to aspire to. And we can see a lot of stuff was related to Tutmos III, Amenhotep III, and his grandmother, Queen T. -T. Um, and we have, these are identified, they have the name of these kings and queens on them. We have their locations and we can kind of see where they were placed based on their um, location. Gifts by elites were also found in the tomb, which aren't 
that common. Um, and these were presented by a general called Nakim, who probably was I's son and probably an important member of King Tut's army. And then also the treasurer Maya, the person who was actually responsible for the building of the tomb and probably for packing it in. And Maya is really unique because we think he was associated with someone who lived during our during Akhenaten's reign and probably just brought his power, uh, his influence and his ability to work over to the next reign. And these guys gave gifts to King Tut's deceased body in order for King Tut in the next life to give good gain favor of him to say, oh, look, I gave you this Ushapti or these Shaptis. Um, make sure I'm prosperous and make sure you don't do anything bad to me. Because even though the Egyptians weren't really fascinated with death, they were fearful of ghosts. So they didn't want these kings to go and make life hard for them. And so they would give them gifts. The childhood artifacts are super fascinating. In fact, there are over 200 artifacts associated with Tut as a child in his burial assemblage. Some of them are coronation items from when he was first coronated as a small child, because we even have the replica, uh, duplicates in adult size versions, especially his scepter and his flail. We have a child size and adult size. Uh, we know some of them were made when he was, before he changed his name to Tutankhamun, because his name appears as Tutankhamun on the Golden Throne, the one of the most recognizable pieces from his burial assemblage. Uh, he had a, when you have a child, you can't give him anything nice. And so when his predecessor died, he was the lead priest responsible for her funerary procession. And so he was given not a real leopard skin to wear as a priest, but a cotton one that had a painted head, a paper mache, paper mache, paper mache, a fake head of a leopard. Sorry. Um, and he had a bunch of ritual artifacts. Uh, he had objects of authorities um, as a scepter and flail. And then they actually had a bunch of loincloths that a child would have worn. Uh, they weren't big enough for an adult. They weren't, they were specifically for King Tut as a kid. So why the, in the world you'd keep a loincloth from a nine-year-old? I don't know, unless you couldn't throw away anything from a king's childhood, especially if he became a king when he was young. But if that was the case, we should have found some similar objects in other tombs um, because people wouldn't have cared about loincloths that's not gold. And so we should have found some in um, tombs of later kings who were children when they came to the throne. And we don't find that at all. I also looked at the names on the artifacts and it's really surprising. We have a few artifacts with the names of the general and the treasurer, but the majority of them are actually immediate family members. Uh, Akhenaten's on several different artifacts. Aunt Keperure, her, her, his immediate predecessor is on a bunch of stuff. Uh, he has a sister, a couple sisters who predeceased him and they're found on artifacts. Uh, Amenhotep III, his grandma, his grandpa, Tutmos, his great, great, great grandfather, uh, possibly his uncle that died. We, uh, that one's a little iffy. But what I found interesting is that you don't find I's name on anything. You don't find his wife's name on anything. Anka's in the moon. Her name's not found on much of anything besides when it's associated with Tut. And so it's just super interesting. I'm like, why, what is happening here? Well, when I looked at the names of, of artifacts, I found that those with associated with deceased family members like Akhenan, Ankepere, and the two sisters who predeceased him were found in the mortuary chambers, in the burial chamber, in the treasure, in the funerary sphere. And then artifacts associated with living members were found in the, daily, in the living spheres, in the antechamber, the annex. And I also found that the majority of the artifacts either originally belonged to Akhenaten or to Ankepirure. And so instead of just grabbing stuff from the royal palaces to stuff King Tut's tomb to make it better for a king's death, they took a bunch of things from Akhenaten and from Ankepirure. And I don't, that's not normal. Um, you don't really see this in any other burial assemblage. Granted, we don't have any other complete as well as we do of King Tut's, 
but you still don't find the same numbers as you do in here. And almost everyone here is deceit or predeceases him. Uh, there are only stuff found with Ox and Moon's name, his wife's name, uh, was on a box found in the daily life than uh, the living sphere of his tomb. I also looked at keepsakes. Now, keepsakes are different than heirlooms. Um, heirlooms are kept for generations. You can kind of think of if you have an heirloom brooch from a great grandma or a ring I'm trying to get from my great aunt. <laughs> and so they're kept for generations and passed from generation to generation. Keepsakes, on the other hand, are just small items that are usually passed from one immediate family member to your next. So like my mom gave me a necklace, so I consider that a keepsake. And um, you're really close to that. It's not something just kept in the family. And so we actually have a bunch of that in King Tut's tomb. As I said before, Akhenaten and Ankeperere had a lot of artifacts in it. And so we have linen shawls with Akhenaten's name written hieratic, the uh, cursive, the fast way to write hieroglyphs. Uh, here's a lid that actually has Ankeperere's name on it, King Tut's name, and his wife's name, Anx and Amun, who is also a princess. And that would have been a keepsake. And then we also have an ivory writing palette from his deceased sister, uh, who is his older sister, but it, he had that in his tomb. So you can kind of see that they were just trying to put all of any item associated with a Marna royal family was being placed in this tomb for some reason. There's just a better way of seeing the names um, from Carter's original photographs. And then we have the repurposed artifacts. Uh, they're typically, de typically described as usurped. In fact, if you ever see a special on King Tut, they're usually talking about his, re his usurped coffin. He took it from someone or his golden bands originally belonged to someone else. I don't think they were usurped so much as they were just repurposed because they needed it for Tut. And his mother, Akhepere, or Pharaoh Akhepere, already had her own queenly artifacts that she could have used in her life during her, um, for her funerary purposes. And all of the repurposed artifacts, in fact, belong to Aunt Capriere and are only found in the mortuary sphere. So that gives me plausible thought that she had her own equipment that she was buried with and that they just took this, that they had originally said, oh yes, here's your kingly stuff, we're making it for you. And then they're like, forget it, you can use your queen stuff that you had. And we can use this for King Tut because it could be practical in this day and age. <laughs> And you can see here, King. this is his prenomen, his Neb Kepirure, and that they dug it out and then replaced it with um, his name, uh, dug out on Kepirure's name and put King Tut's prenomen in there instead. And so I got back to this idea of inalienable possession, possessions, because I'm like, why would these artifacts associated with his deceased family members be placed in a tomb meant for him? This is supposed to be his eternal house. How, why do you have junk laying around from your family members? And I came upon this idea of inalienable possessions. And these, possess these are artifacts that are connected to specific individual's identity. Um, they're connected to a king or, or the leader of a group or uh, um, uh, religiously or political leader, something like that. And they're usually kept within a small group and you don't really circulate them. They aren't passed down from generation to generation. You just have to keep them with that small group. And these objects actually become repositories of knowledge. Um, they can represent histories of social relationships and you have to make sure that if you don't want the social history to be known, that you keep it hidden and you hide it away. Uh, Barbara Mills uh, wrote about a bunch of inalienable possessions um, and that's where I got this idea from. And I'm like, oh my God, this makes sense of why Tut has all of these weird childhood artifacts and the artifacts associated with his dead family members in his tomb when it should just be about him and living his greatest life in the afterlife, but it really isn't. And so these are some of these inalienable possessions. They're like they're very 
they're very much the keepsake artifacts and the repurposed artifacts. Um, the heirlooms are just more general heirlooms, but these keepsakes and repurposed ones really are inalienable objects that could not be circulated. They had bad juju. <laughs> they represented a time period of Egyptian history that the Egyptians desperately wanted to forget and return to the orthodox, return to the traditional pantheon and practices that had kept them so strong for so long. And so these are the same artifacts, anything with Akhenaten's name, Akeperure's name, Merit Aten, anyone associated with King Tut, or anyone asso anything associated with the King Akeperure, who was this problem king because she was a woman and the Egyptians didn't really like women as their kings, or at least the later guys didn't, because how dare a woman rule? And so what they were trying to do is they were intentionally trying to forget this Amarna period. You have to remember Tut when he died, didn't bury himself. Um, it was left to his successor, I, who actually was in a battle for the throne with the general Horemheb. And so I had to probably didn't tell Horemheb that Tut died when he did, because Horemheb was probably fighting a battle in the Near East. And so that gave I time to actually prepare this burial in order to bury Tut. And if I did that, he could legitimize his claim to the throne, because it's a to the ancient Egyptians, it was up to the son to bury the father. And um, then you could become, gain all the power of the father. And even though I was probably Tut's grandfather, or at least royal vizier, he wanted that throne for himself and thought he could guide Egypt back to traditional orthodoxy. And so I realized he was in a pickle. He needed to honor the royal family because it was still a king he was having to bury. But he also needed to erase any evidence of these heretic kings. You had Aganaten, you had Ankeperure, and then you had this boy king who really didn't do much. And I saw the opportunity to say, oh, nothing happened between Amenhotep III and me. Like everything was great. I just came to power and it was fantastic. And so KV62 really was the ideal opportunity for I to jump on this to erase everyone. And so it actually became this repository to psychologically quarantine anything relating to the Amarna royal family, especially anything sitting around or that may have had personal connection to King Tut or had inalienable possessions to him. And so you could put all the stuff in the proper sphere, in the mortuary sphere or in the daily life sphere, and then you could just conceal it and forget it. And you could say nothing ever happened. And you can even see this through the GIS. When you look at the uh, view shed or visibility analysis, where you look at where the tombs are and if, what tomb could be seen from that location if you're standing at the entrance of the tomb, you could see that KV62, which is this blue star, it sits right in the middle and its entrance before it was uh, covered actually had the visibility of all the different tombs from earlier in the 18th dynasty. In fact, he you could see 38 tombs if you just stood at the entrance of King Tut's tomb. When you look at all the post armada tombs, all these tombs that came afterwards, they're all within that same clustered area. And they're in the heart of the 18th dynasty. So even though you're, um, you think these guys are fools for trying to change something that had not been changed for thousands of years, you still had to honor them. And so I had these tombs buried in the Valley of the Kings um, in the heart of the family cemetery. So you weren't ostracizing them. You weren't trying to erase them completely. You were honoring them because their ghosts and their spirits would still be part of the royal family. Um, and so they're part of the family tradition. But you could also make sure they would disappear from the surface. <laughs> The Valley of the Kings is known to flood. Um, they ha do have sporadic floods and it's actually gotten worse in the last 50 years since the Aswan Dam was built and climate change. Um, and so when you do a stream analysis or when you look at the topography and you can see where the streams form, you can actually see that the majority of the tombs of the 18th dynasty actually fall near the, str the stream paths that occur. Um, and they favored these locations. The earlier tombs, the first kings of the 18th dynasty actually built them in the cliff sides. And so when the water comes there, it flows over them like a waterfall. And so the spirit of the king would walk through the waterfall and be purified and cleansed. But the locations of the post martyr tombs are actually right on the valley floor. And you kind of 
see what happens to them. They get covered by sediment. And that's why we actually are discovering these post-Amara tombs now in the 20th and 21st century instead of all the way being exposed like all the other tombs were for thousands of years. And so we actually have um, evidence to suggest that they were all clustered in the heart of the family uh, cemetery. KV-5, I didn't mention earlier, but um, it eventually got taken over by Ramses II and expanded to the 100 chamber tomb. But the original portion of it was an 18th dynasty post armada tomb, and that just got taken over. But um, they were all be covered by flash flood by sediments. And that explains how King Tut's tomb, though was robbed relatively early once it had been, um, uh, once he had been buried in it, was pretty much forgotten about and you couldn't even see about, you couldn't even find it for centuries. And we know this is true because KV 55, the one that might hold the body of Akhenaten, actually was dug into during the 9th, 20th dynasty when they were trying to dig a tomb and the, uh, or the 19th dynasty and the tomb builders came upon it and realized that they found a tomb of a king that they had completely forgotten about because they didn't know where they put it. And so these tomb builders and I figuring out where to put all these post modern tombs realized that they could honor them and then they could forget it. And this is actually really typical in ancient Egypt, especially during the 18th dynasty. They were famous for erasing problematic kings that didn't fall in their traditional idea of a male strong man military king. In fact, uh, Hatshepsut, the female king of the early 18th dynasty, this is Daryl Bahri, uh, which is an amazing site. Uh, the Met's done a great job restoring it. It, her, all of her statues of herself as Osiris had been defaced and broken apart by her two successors because they couldn't understand the idea that a woman ruled for 20 years in a really peaceful and prosperous time. Uh, that just didn't fit with their ideology. We also see this happening with King Tut disfiguring his own father's artifacts as well. This is a row of sphinxes that originally had a head of Akhenaten and Nefertiti on it that King Tut made them rechange so it have a head of a moon, the god that he was trying to please the priesthood with, and a replica of himself. The, then those were later erased for someone different. We also see uh, Akhenaten had a temple built at Karnak. Um, it's called the Genpa Aten, and they are used these blocks called talatats. So they're kind of, oops, sorry. They're really, they're small and kind of like a shoebox size, but they have all these distinct Akhenaten Amarna period covering or designs on them and a lot of inscriptions and they was dismantled and placed upside down inside a pylon by Horemheb, Tut's eventual successor, because he didn't want anything relating to the Amarna period to be visible at all and ironically hiding it in a pylon in a gate actually saved it for centuries so now we know more about Amarna than we do about Horemheb. And speaking of Horemheb, he took this huge statue that was a physical representation of King Tut, probably right before he died, erased his name and put Horemheb's name, his own name on instead of King Tut. And so this idea of erasing problematic kings really is an 18th dynasty, 18th dynasty tradition uh, that is kind of fascinating and makes a lot of sense for what happens with King Tut's tomb and why it becomes this repository or this um, uh, the storage shed for anything relating to the Marna period. It was the last chance to get rid of stuff um, that people just didn't want hanging out anymore. And so in conclusion, um, Oh, good. Uh, we have um, post Amara tombs are probably built all around the same time period. Um, they're all covered about the same time period, the same level uh, too. And they're part of the larger 18th dynasty royal cemetery, so they're honoring them. Um, but they are also in locations that could be easily forgotten and just not dealt with anymore. I also was able to find inalienable artifacts uh, that have specific connections with these people that um, had 
power and tried to change a monarchy that didn't want to be changed. And so you had to treat them with respect, just as you did the location of the tomb, but you also want to hide everything so you could restore it to tradition. And as I said before, KB62 really was a psychological quarantine for this traumatic experience to the royal and elite family members of Egypt. The common people probably didn't even care. Those up in the Delta were like, oh, he died. <laughs> but this royal court, in order to survive and for I to really claim um, his succession to the throne, uh, had to get rid of everything and erase it. Ironically, Horemheb, I successor, did the same thing. And by the time we get to these kings lists of the 19th dynasty, it goes from Amenhotep III to Horemheb. And there's a 40 year period where none of the kings are even mentioned because they did not like this Amarna period. And so KV-62 and these other tombs really were out of sight and out of mind. And you could go on with your life and not worry about them anymore. That's all I have for my uh, presentation. Thank you again uh, to you guys, to your Archaeological Society. I really enjoyed it. And this is um, thanks to everyone else. So if anyone has any questions, please let me know. I actually have a question. Yeah. Um, I you think you probably kind of mentioned it a little bit. So um, he had sisters, right? Or the Nefertiti and the other guy had, they had daughters at one point. And did they find their tombs or were they just not even... We are still looking for them. Um, Zahi Awas, you know, the Egyptian guy with the fedora who goes on TV, he keeps looking for um, Ankh and Amun, his wife's tomb. Um, but we don't have their tombs at all. Like they, they're probably buried somewhere in the Theban necropolis because that huge, it's a really big mountain. And there, it's probably, there's a bunch of stuff still buried out there. But we still don't have any of their tombs. Um, we know. One, one sister died at Amarna and her tomb um, was part of the royal tomb at Amarna. And there's actually a scene of the whole family crying and you don't ever see that in Egyptian art. Like you just, you, they don't want anyone to show that they're human. They're supposed to be gods. But Akhenaten and Nefertiti are there holding their heads, wailing while their daughter died. And so we know she was probably buried in Amarna, but those tombs were um, robbed in the late eight. 19th century. But the other sisters, we don't know where they are. We don't know what happened to their bodies. Anks and Amun, who is the queen of King Tut, and then married I probably to help him legitimize his throne more. Her burial still hasn't been discovered. If they ever find that, that might be the next big thing, a big golden tomb from King Tut. But yeah, we don't know where any of that is. And now more people are like, oh, we should break down the wall in King Tut's tomb to see if Nefertiti really is back there. Because if she's back there, she probably has a bunch of stuff that hasn't been touched for 4,000 years. So that would be pretty amazing. But it's kind of like the Emperor Qin's tomb in China where you're like, do we want to touch it? Can we really prepare everything and make sure it doesn't disintegrate? So yeah, it'd be cool if we could find those tombs though. I have a question. How yeah. many tombs? How many tombs? I have a quick question. Oh. oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, with Zahi Awas and mm -hmm. other Egypt Egyptologists, how many tombs do you think there might be that still haven't been uncovered? Um, well, we know for a fact that in the 18th dynasty, we're still missing several tombs. I think we're missing three king tombs and one and a, and a lot of queen tombs we don't have their queen tombs at all like during the 19th dynasty when Ramses II came around they actually had their own cemetery outside of the valley of the kings um, on the other side of uh, the mountaintop uh, called the valley of the queens right. and we know a bunch of elites were probably buried in there and then the 18th dynasty guy or the 19th dynasty guys might have come in and like kicked out the, or got rid of the uh, tombs because they were there and they didn't want to try building them but i think in the valley itself uh they're doing more uh gpr um someone just went in with uh i can't remember what kind of machine but they did more topography looking at different chambers saying there might be something here. So I know we're missing three. Um, Ox and the Moons for sure. Um, 
Yeah, so maybe four or five. Deliveries to be made. <laughs> oh yeah, no, and, and the best part, this is my most favorite part. There was this guy about 400 years after King Tut. His name was Harry Hor, and he was the high priest of the moon. And he literally was king of like Southern Egypt during this time period. He went in and stole all of the artifacts from all the tombs he could find and put them in his own tomb. And we don't know where that tomb is. Like we think he went further back into the mountain and um, into a different valley and we still haven't found it yet. But that tomb would have stuff from Ramses II, Seti I, Ramses III, like all the big guys because he actually knew where they, those tombs were and had they had been robbed during antiquity and he probably took a bunch of that stuff. So that tomb would be even more impressive than uh, <laughs> other ones. And I'm sure Kent, Kent Weeks is probably looking for it right now. Oh, probably, yeah. Yeah, he just restarted the Theban mapping project. It had been uh, down for a while, um, but hopefully they're doing more stuff with it now. I'm not sure what's happening or what's happened the last year because of the pandemic, but yeah. Thank you. Thank you. I have a quick question. Yes. Well, actually, I kind of have two. Um, one, how possible is it for them to use DPR over the section where Nefertiti could be buried? Or is it so deep that it wouldn't be caught? Actually, it's not that hard. Uh it's gotten better. Um, I There was just an article out in 2019. Uh, they didn't use GPR, they used something a little bit better than that. Uh, I think it was, I can't remember off the top of my head, but I could email it to you. Okay. Um, but they actually did find these two um, voids in similar locations where Nicholas Reeves or Nick Reeves is saying yeah. that there might be the chambers. Um, but once again, it's like, well, do we go through the top? Do we really want to destroy that wall? Um, they've just spent a lot of money and did a 3D digital replica of King Tut's tomb that now you can walk in so you don't actually um, disturb the, uh, the tomb itself. So it's something up to the Egyptians that maybe if they, they're, they're desperate for more tourist money and they'll be like, yes, we're gonna open this. And we'll be like, ah, please invite the Germans to help you do that. <laughs> Uh, what was your second question? <laughs> yeah, and then my, um, so I had a lot of audio delay for the beginning. Will this recording be available for us to watch later as well? Like a link through email or something maybe? Hi, uh, this is Chris. We're gonna try to post it to our YouTube. So look for that in the next month or two. Perfect, thank you. Uh -huh. You're welcome. Any more questions? Any more questions? I don't see any more in the chat. Okay. Thank you so much for the talk. It was really great and I very much enjoyed it. I'm sure everyone else oh, did. Oh, good, good. Well, thank you for allowing me again. I really appreciate it. I enjoy talking about this. It's King Tut, who doesn't like King Tut? <laughs> yeah, you know, that Egypt just gets you going. <laughs> mm -hmm. It does.